The Steve Austin Show. The Steve Austin Show. Well, I'm rolling sound right now. I got Ryback, Ryan Allen Reeves on a video cast. Ryan, how are you? Doing well, Steve. Doing well. Enjoying the weekend here. Watched uh, the UFC fights last night and uh, got all amped up watching that, so I'm feeling good. Man, it's good to see you. I got you on uh, the video here. I ain't seen you in a long time. Uh, yeah. uh, what have you been up to? Shit, since last time we talked, I don't know, has it been, that's probably about four and a half years, I, I think, when I talked to you. I, I, I That was on my way out already at that point, and uh, was already pretty frustrated. I remember because I was, uh, it was in L.A., I think we talked a week or two before about doing the show. And uh, I think I had had the Intercontinental title. I I just dropped it to KO. We were doing the rematch in LA. And I I was already kind of on my way out with everything and unhappy. And um, shortly thereafter, after we did that episode, I ended up walking away and leaving. And uh, there was, I told you I was really, really injured at the end of the, a lot of people don't understand the severity of all the, the root of the cause was, um, my back was really bad and my shoulder was bad and uh, I was getting toured all every day. And, and I, when reality, you know, when you get up there and you get caught up in the bubble and uh, you go week to week, you try to prove to everyone you keep going and uh, you don't want to, you don't want to miss any time. And that was in five years. I'd hardly miss. I think I missed like 11 weeks total and right around five years after that on that little run. And I knew something internally was telling me that uh, I had to get the fuck out because it just, there was a voice in my head that and it just said you got to leave and there were a lot of other creative things and a lot of things that had happened that led to all that but um i'll never forget it was uh, i did the uh the Callisto stuff uh where that was supposed to be me and vince i uh, agreed on a new deal they'd offered me deal, but there was some stuff going on where they wanted to feed me more of the big guy that i trademarked ryback that i created before i got there it just kind of started butting heads on that end uh we agreed on on a on a number uh me and vince but on the other stuff we didn't agree on and when i didn't sign that contract and i came back with the revisions with it the the handshake agreement with vince for the world heavyweight championship and the big heel push and switching to trunks which is why all this didn't kind of add up with everyone when all that happened um then turned into me being demoted uh for the u.s title with Kalisto. And then when I didn't sign the contract, it was the match got moved to the pre-show on uh, WrestleMania. And then when I didn't, that then that went from winning to losing. Then that went, when I didn't sign that contract after that, it went to getting put on the pre-show again with Kalisto and uh, did the job there for him. Is it loved working with him. And then shortly thereafter, I got to St. Louis and the writing was on the wall. They were going to start kind of, um, they were going to start lowering my value pretty quickly on TV. And I just, it was an easy decision for me. I, I was like, I got to get out of here now and, and save face with everything. And the injuries kind of reared their their head shortly thereafter when the cortisone and tore it all wore out, wore out. I was told I needed a five disc fusion and shoulder replacement, which started all this for me. So now how are they going to devalue you on television? Just start jobbing you out, less of storylines, yeah. less TV time, what? It was, uh, so this particular- Because there's so many what? ways they can do it. Oh, absolutely. And we're all familiar. And it's, it's the way the business is. If you're not going to re-sign with them, it doesn't matter who you are, what you've done. It will, they will lower the value one way or the other. I was in so much pain though. I just wasn't, and I've already put, I had already put up with enough shit up to that point. I, I was, I knew how much value I still had. I knew if I left at that point in time, internally, I knew that I could come back and I could still be at a higher level if I left at that point in time. Um, the way they were going to start doing it is nothing against any of the other talent, but it was, uh, they're going to, I think, start a program with Titus O'Neil. And it was a, a U.S. Championship Battle Royal. Uh, Fred, I had just been the number one contender, and it was me in there, and it was me getting eliminated right off the bat. Uh, me and uh, Apollo by Titus O'Neil. And uh, and I knew that was, I was, from what I was told, it was to then start a program with Titus. Uh, and I love Titus and whatnot, and, but it was, I knew where they were going with it and what they were doing, and I knew some other things, and I just knew, I go, I'm not interested in playing this game anymore, and I got to get out. And so. The writing was on the wall. I said, hey, man. But, yeah. you know, it's funny because you, you say you're at a high level of pain because, you know, when you're kind of being devalued, you're not being used right, and you're frustrated to begin with at that point, when you throw severe pain on top of it, I mean, yes. to me, uh, it, it's, it, it can make for a very edgy experience. I mean, because – you, you, you don't want to be fucked with. You don't feel good. And, and now it's kind of like DEFCON 5. Pain kind of escalates everything, along with being frustrated. But pain yeah. it just makes you think different. You Hey, man, i got to get this shit right. 
Yeah, no doubt. And, and a lot of people, man, I'm, I'm beyond thankful for everything I, I've been able to achieve in pro wrestling. And, and for and I was with WWE since I was 22 years old, going through developmental. I've been in the system for a long time, and I've talked about it and explained it. And a lot of people, there was a lot of, there's been a lot of bad things that have happened. You know, my ankle injury when I was 28 and with the Nexus, that whole thing, and broke my ankle. And there was a botched surgery, and, and the company tried to fire me when I was told I was never going to wrestle again. And I had to get attorneys to keep my job, and I butted heads with Hunter and them to get back, just to come back, just to fight to keep my job, to come back as Ryback. And so all that whole thing, it was the relationship was strained from the beginning. And from the main event run and having pulled out of that for no reason, having all my merchandise pulled when I was number two in the company, there was a lot of creative frustrations along the way that I stayed positive with and always believed that I was able to overcome. Once the pain started rearing its head and showing up like it was, in my back and waking up in the hotel rooms and falling to my knees and starting to get some stuff going on in my right leg and being young still. And, and but in that, and then in seeing the drugs being given to you and I, I'm very health conscious, there just comes a point where, you know, you're, what am I doing with myself? We've seen what happens with pro wrestlers dying younger than everybody else. I just kind of had enough information where I was like, it's okay to get out right now, figure it out and just get away from the situation with a clear head. Okay, now, way back in the day, I was wrestling with, uh, I can't remember who I was working with, but we were at the Meadowlands Arena, and Booger T pushed me through a table. Yeah. And I skipped off that just like a stone, skipping across water, and I slid right into a chair, and I broke three of the transverse processes in my back. Wasn't Booger's fault. It was just a, me slipping across that table and hitting my back. So that being said, you know, that was kind of during my heel run. And so every night, you know, I couldn't work because I was in too much pain, yeah. having those three fresh broke bones in my back. So... Every time I went to a, 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 a town, there would be a doctor waiting for me in the bathroom with 60 milligrams of Toradol and shooting my ass up. And as you know, the, the cool thing about Toradol, it's non-narcotic. It's a pain blocker. Man, I tell you what, when I first got that first shot of Toradol, I was in San Antonio. I said, hey, I, I'm well. I feel good. Hell, I went and squatted. God dang, dude. That Toradol wore off, and I was like, you stupid motherfucker. What are you doing? So anyway, yeah. uh, so I was on the Toradol shots for a long time. I went, eh, several months. Were you on for a couple of years? Over and, probably and, three years, and then cortisone in my joint. Okay, hang on about, hang, but yeah, but hang, yeah, but hang on yeah. about that cortisone. Were you just doing a Toradol, or then were you doing Vikes and Perks along with that as needed? No. I, I'm not a pain pill guy, so I never went pain pill, but I was doing ibuprofen, four pills three times a day, as they advised. But my thing was those those months, those weeks turned into months, turned into years. And I found that I was – and the problem too, Steve, is – um, and being a power-based wrestler. And I was wrestling big show mo live events, Mark Henry Kane. I was the guy picking those guys up. And I'm bumping more than I usually would bump because I'm the small guy working them, which I always loved because I was able to get the sympathy and get that reaction at the end. Yeah. Uh, problem with that is, is that's a lot working out every day, driving three to five hours every night, and then doing those feet to strength every night. Five nights a week will wear you out really, really quickly. Uh, and on top of I had that ankle injury, those nerves in my ankle that got botched run directly into my L4, L5, which were the first two discs that started degenerating on me. And it just all kind of all just kind of just all it crept up slowly. And then it just got to the point where and you nailed it on the head. When you're in severe pain like that, there's something the bullshit that I put up with before that I I was going to work my way out of it, prove myself just didn't make sense to me. And I had a certain level of financial freedom already at that point where I go, you know what, it's OK to walk out and bet on myself right now. And I just I remember the day really clear. And Billy Kidman goes, just don't say anything bad about the company. You know, you'll come back whenever you want. I go, Billy, fuck that. I'm going to say everything that's happened. And I'm still going to come back when I fucking want, because I know what I bring to the table. And I know what I'm capable of. So and I've done just that. <laughs> hey, boy, take me through those cortisone shots, because, you know, I've yeah. got a buddy and he's gotten about three or four already. And I said, hey, dude, you're kind of at your limit yep. because you're only supposed to have a couple of those things to begin with. Yeah. It sounds like you were getting a whole lot of them. And, dude, when you once you start doing that, it kind of, well, you, you take us through it. And, and how long were you on the course on? So it all started. I had a shoulder injury in, in developmental, Steve, at Florida Championship Wrestling. That I actually got my first year in wrestling with Bill Damont at Deep South. I tore a bicep tendon, and I didn't get it fixed. And so I'd had some shoulder issues in, in when I was through the developmental system. And it finally, my shoulder, I had the labrum tear, the the all the whole deal. The shoulder just needed to get operated on. They fixed it, got it all better. Get up to TV, though. I had all this scar tissue. The, the medical program isn't what it was back then. And, and it, like your time, it was non-existent. Oh. And, 
And, and so it's kind of evolved over the, the generations to what it is. And, and I think we all wish we have what they have now. And it, it just wasn't quite at that level yet. So I had all this scar tissue in my shoulder. And I'm doing the lacrosse ball. I'm reading books on what I could do to self-medicate myself or self-rehab. you know, rehab. So they, they started, they, the doctors, and again, I got to take all accountability because I said yes to everything. And I'm more than, again, capable of enough of researching stuff and knowing if something's good or bad for me. But I also go at face value and, and, and will, if someone tells me I'm going to be okay doing this, I, I, I want to trust and believe them. And again, though, the weeks turned to months, turned to years. They started off with a really small amount of, of cortisone into my shoulder joint uh, in, in to help, and it helped tremendously, took away all the pain that I was into, allowed me to do all the power stuff and pressing guys every night. And it, it, it just it eventually started taking a toll. And they started giving me more and more cortisone, I noticed. And it was starting to be two, three, four times a year um, in the joint. Eventually, I'll never forget it. I think we were, it was in Minnesota at an LA fitness and I grabbed the big, whatever the heaviest dumbbells were. And I went to go do an incline dumbbell press and my shoulder just started grinding. And it was like, make it like the, 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 it was, I go, what the fuck? I, I go, I've never had it like the, the bone on bone. And, and that was the beginning of the, the cortisone ate away all the cartilage, Steve, in my shoulder joint. So when I left WWE and that tore it all and that cortisone was not in my body anymore, it was like I was 35 at the time, 34, getting almost 35. It was like turning into a 95-year-old man. I, I My right leg completely atrophied from the nerves in my back. My right arm completely atrophied. The nerves in my, in my tricep and my shoulder and my right lat completely disappeared. And I just I go, this is a guy that's been physical his whole life, and I've just now lost the one thing that I've always had. And, uh, and again, people would look at me, and I still 275, 280 at the time, but internally – I, I felt like a very I, – I felt like I lost my superpowers essentially and uh, it, it was the beginning where it just – it got worse and worse and worse. I couldn't even lie on the ground and play with my dogs. I couldn't get up and I go, how the fuck was I, was I doing this? What happened to me? And you know, I get the MRI and then they tell me you need a five-disc fusion shoulder replacement, two different doctors. I'm like, I'm 34. Like there's no way. If I go that route, I've seen all the guys that get one disc fused. They're not the same. You know, and I saw Ron Simmons at a signing and he had two of his disc fused. He goes, don't do it if you if you can avoid it, you know, because he goes, it helps with the pain, but you can't do what you once did. And I was just, you know, I saw Buff Bagwell at a fucking show and Buff had a shoulder replacement. He couldn't do anything. I go, this isn't an option for me. And that's when I, I started looking into options and stem cells came into the picture. So, but it, it's, it's rough, man. That cortisone, there's, I tell people. It's there no good can come from it. It really, it, it really, really is bad for the body. If it's a, if it's an emergency and it's one time, maybe. But the problem is, is that pain that it takes away, it, it makes you think that you're okay, and it's, it's putting on a band aid that's going to make the wound much worse when you take it off. I agree with that. I didn't know Ron Simmons had, had a, a two level fusion. Was it into C level or T level or L? It was his back. It was at a signing. This was a couple of years ago at a WrestleMania, yeah. WrestleCade, uh, a WrestleCon signing, and he uh, and he just told me it was it was at that period where I was trying to figure out exactly what I think I'd started the stem cells, but he just said, you know, don't do it. If you can avoid it, he, he, that was like a last resort for him. And everyone I've talked to, I've never seen anyone get their back or your neck views where they come out of it, where they're actually physically stronger than they were before. It tends to go the other way. Yeah. You know, I was lucky when I got my C3, four fusion years ago, really uh, Dr. Lloyd Youngblood in San Antonio, he wanted to do a three level fusion. But he goes, man, if I do that, you're going to be done. And so he fused up three, four. He cleaned me out. I kind of had spinal stenosis to start off with. Then I had a bone spur growing into my spinal cord. Then on top of when Owen had dropped me on my head, I bruised my spinal cord, which was really causing all the neurological issues and the atrophy in the hands, the hyper-reflexive lower extremity stuff, which is weird once you start messing with nerve stuff. That's no No control. So I was able to get back in the ring. And then, you know, I faded off and retired when I did uh, and uh, I'm glad I got fused up I'm glad I had a surgery it didn't let me it didn't limit me in, in any other capacity other than the fact that I, I had a lot of damage and I finally had to walk away and yeah. go uh, you know do, do I guess do what I'm doing now when you it's started doing too mentally man. oh people well, don't understand that I've heard you talk about it and it's 
for me, I, I walked away for millions of dollars at the prime of my career. I didn't get the chance to to even have what I thought I was capable of doing. It was a tough decision. And I've, I've overcome a lot of it now with all of this. But I listen to you talk sometimes and I feel it because I was like, didn't, I walked away. At that it, It's not easy. And people, I think being in the spotlight and, and being a, a larger than life character and persona and then going into real life, man, in pro wrestling, don't translate to anything else in real life. It, it, it's a tough thing. Well, I always tell everybody, hey, man, be, being a really good in a 20 by 20 squared circle at telling a story or doing your gimmick don't really qualify you for anything else. I mean, you know, you can use your name to go get and do other things. It'll help you in that regard. But I was 38 when I walked away and I was talking to Dale Earnhardt Jr. You know, he had had, you know, in crashes, he had uh, 20 plus concussions and he had to walk away from the sport. You know, the doctor didn't say, hey, you got to quit. The same thing with me. The doctor didn't look at me and said, hey, Steve, you got to quit. You know, but I knew where I was and I was looking a gift horse in the mouth. You know, once you once you start worried about what's going to happen to you, yeah, and if you can't take care of you, you can't take care of the other guy, you need to get out. But man, that was a hard pill to swallow. And it took me years to get over that and walk it away really at the prime. Uh, if I had been so beat up from a neurological level, yep. man, my ring smarts, my psychology is, it was very advanced, my promo. And then I walked away, but you walked away younger than I did. So, so then how old were you? 34, 34. But so in the, the, that's what you just said is I'm living like kind of a movie right now, Steve, where the stem cells, I've had 14 procedures. My disc and my back are all regrown. My back is 100% better. My shoulder is almost all better. I've had seven or eight on my shoulder. I'm getting one more done for good measure. And I feel like now knowing what I know, I physically feel better than I've ever felt since I was in my 20s with my injuries. I'm just trying to get the shoulder a little stronger. I feel like it's one of those surreal things out of a movie that I now have the wisdom in the brain uh, of everything psychology wise that I'd learned over the years. And I'm actually now physically, I've gotten like, I always tell, I tell people jokingly, I'm getting my superpowers back once again. So I feel like to do something really special. So it, it's, uh, I'm very blessed on that end. You talk about those few years when you left, man, I kept myself busy doing the podcast and, and starting my supplement line. And I ran everything because I, I had to keep my mind busy with all of this because I would have gone crazy. And watching everything, and you want you watch it on TV, and you see the opportunities that present themselves. I'm like, and Cena's gone now. I go, fuck. If I could have just held on for a couple more years, but I couldn't. I had to get out, and I've always kind of been protected on that end. And it's all been for the best. And I got everything in place, and I've been able to get my health back, which is again, it's it, it. I've had 14 stem cell procedures. It, that's unheard of. To that, but that's how many it's taken for me to get to my to to get back to where I was and. Uh, it, it, it's truly remarkable what, what they're capable of now. Man, give me the long story short and don't go too scientific on me so, so I can understand it. And I guess so the listeners can too. I've been hearing about stem cells. I've been offered, hey, man, uh, fly down to Columbia. <laughs> yes. <laughs> hey, fly down to Columbia. I want to stay here in the United States of America. I still don't understand. And I guess I could have, uh, you know, I've got all these brochures, same, because you went down to Columbia, right? Yeah, Steve, yeah. That, that's with that bioaccelerator company. So I'll tell you yeah. right now, I had 11 here in Vegas, and I'm getting another one by my doctor here in Vegas. This is I've, this is how life works out for me. It, it, this company calls me, and they, they listen to the show. They realize how fucked up I, they have. They paid $40,000 of treatment. They flew me down. Steve, the entire facility down there in Medellin, Colombia, I was terrified. Me, but Kevin Nash was going down with me. And we both, me and Kevin had a moment down there where we go, man, we were prepared to die. We were both so fucked up that we just knew that like, whatever the, I'm taking my chances. You're going to pay. I've just spent all this money here and the treatment down there. Like, so for, just so you understand each treatment here in the States with my bone marrow, they were, they given me about a million stem cells per treatment. I went down there, they gave me 175 million stem cells from umbilical cords where they're just way more powerful. And that, that's what ultimately put me, got me past the hump that I was stuck at. But me and Kevin just looked at each other down there and he goes, were you prepared to die? I go, I was prepared to fucking die. And we just embraced and we were just like, we were the fucking guinea pigs for this. Now all the boys are going down and it, 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 it's a great setup they got down there. But you think of Pablo Escobar and all the fucking cocaine and all the bullshit. But I tell you, Steve, Women, the most beautiful women in the world, they got a beautiful facility down there in a five-story mall. You don't even have to leave the, the hotels in the mall. You walk around the mall. It's just every girl in there is beautiful, every woman in there, just everything. I, and I go, 
what a great fucking life. I go, this company just paid for a week trip down here. They got me. They just corrected two problems in me that I couldn't overcome. And, and I got to hang out with Kevin Nash all week, who I grew up fucking loving, and got to shoot this shit with him and did the podcast. It was a great time, man. Well, you were down there five or seven days. Yeah, I think it was a total of five or six days total for the whole week. It was down there one week, though. Okay, so how does the process work? Are they they, they taking out your blood or your bone marrow? Yeah. What are they spinning up and re-injecting back into you, right? Yeah, so down there, because you're using umbilical cord stem cells, of, so everything is, is the from, the from everything I understand, it's from the uh, pregnant women who consent. It, it's, from, it's not from dead babies or anything of that nature. And they're able to grow the umbilical cords. They do it, I believe, up to four or five times to get the, the perfect amount of cells they draw your blood early in the week. They draw the amount of blood that they need to get the platelet-rich plasma that they end up spinning with the stem cells that they that they grow, and they end up mixing it together. They did one treatment for me. Kevin got a couple where they hook you up to the IV, where they give you they gave me 50 million stem cells through an IV early in the week. Then the, the procedure day was a couple days later, where they bring you in, they bring you into the facility. You get all you got the fucking deal on the, the little net hat and just like surgery. They sometimes I've always been put under here in the states. What they do there, though, is they put you under, but you're still kind of conscious because they had to move me around to do multiple places. So they couldn't have my big ass all completely dead all the time. They, I had to get, like, for my back, they had to inject these huge-ass needles into my disc, five of my disc. And I actually got photos up on Instagram of these huge needles in there. And they take that platelet-rich plasma with the umbilical cord stem cells that they spin together to get the stem, the, the bioaccelerator stem cell deal. And they inject them into each disc. Because like my disc, if I my disc, Steve, too, with that, they caught it just in time where my discs were completely worn thin, but they were just intact enough that that they were able to regrow the actual disc and plumping them back up, which is just, to me, surreal. Had those been worn out completely, they would not have been able to fix me with those. But that's what they do. They inject those into my disc. Then the shoulder, they inject it everywhere. You got the muscle tears inside the joint, inside the capsule to help regrow the cartilage because the cartilage cells are still there. So the stem cells are able to actually regrow the cartilage as well inside the joint. And then they gave me some stuff for my leg as well. But you're you're passed out, but you're you don't feel a thing with that. And uh, it, it, it's truly remarkable what they do. But here in the States, they actually use my bone marrow. So they do a bone marrow graft where they actually take it from my hip, which is pain. I, you don't feel, I don't feel a thing when they do it. But they're able to drill out the little bit of bone marrow from your hip and mix that with the platelet-rich plasma here in the States. And then they re-inject that into the different – like I get the MRI done. They know exactly through an ultrasound what areas to inject in. And then you just – I always treat it like surgery where after – like I took two months off of weights after those stem cells and let everything just heal. <sighs> I'm at a loss it's a lot. Words. How, so if if they took an MRI of your back, those yeah. five levels, and they were worn down, now if they take an MRI, they're – Look normal. Normal? Yeah. My back, shoot, had, straight up shoot. Straight up Steve, this is why people have looked at me from this and don't understand the, the whole situation of this. My career was fucking done. It was over. I, I did Indies for two years when I left WWE – only for strict because I was making four or five grand a pop on every show to go out and work. And I'd work a match with a small guy. I would do my shit. I'd put my time in, do it. But it was because I spent all this money on my supplement line. I knew I had a, sh a short window to make that money to kind of balance up what I was putting out for the supplements. And then after that two-year mark, I, I had to stop. My doctor yelled at me. He goes, you need to fucking stop. He goes, you, you need to give your body a rest and just let this. He goes, what you're doing has never been done. Don't fucking ruin this for yourself. I keep going out there there and doing stupid shit. And but Steve, I didn't believe it. I had nothing to lose. I lost my everything that I've worked my entire life for. And I knew if I went the surgical route, I'd be done. I kept an optimistic mindset and I said, you know what? If I die, I die. Because it's like I'm not I, I I need to be able to go out and do like I was prepared and I, I knew I wasn't gonna die doing this, but I, I had to be patient. I shut off the competitive gene in me. I said I just let my ego go. I go. I have nothing to lose. I've already lost what I had. I had to walk away from it. My only thing is to believe is optimistic and believe in this technology and believe in what they're telling me. And it's taken. It wasn't one procedure. I've done this. I've done this fourteen times. It, it's for three years because I, I I I want what I had back so badly, and I want a chance to be able to physically be myself again because I lost my health. So I wouldn't believe it either unless I've lived it, and, and I don't expect anyone to understand because. But I've lived it, and it's truly, truly remarkable. Is there a limit to how many stem cell procedures you can have done? 
No. This, I mean, the stem cells work for about four to six months of actual healing. And uh, like I said, it, there's been no, uh, I'm the most patient person in the world when I want something bad enough. I'll take as long as it needs to take. I, I knew after I got the first one, Steve, I was in so much pain and I quit taking ibuprofen because my body, my liver, I didn't want to take it anymore. Yeah. And I just dealt with the pain. And I, I said, I have nothing to lose by doing this. And that first procedure probably improved me, I would say 35 to 40% in my back enough where I go, you know what? This shit works. I don't know how well it can keep working, but I'm prepared to take that chance. And I've spent a lot of money and insurance has helped out quite a bit on a lot of it. But man, it's um I'm here today pain free. I'm doing shit. I'm I just squatted five fifty a couple weeks ago with uh I'm training with uh Nick Best, one of the world's strongest men, doing workouts that I didn't think I was ever gonna get to do again. And I'm completely pain free and I've I've built my core up now. Like that's the other thing. Now I've I've learned so much about core strength and doing these things for wrestling that we don't know about like us wrestlers man we need the strongest cores in the world to do what we do out there and for that abuse and uh, and sometimes we can only learn from the past and so now my goal is to build the most indestructible core and be the strongest motherfucker i could be so that that shit can't break me down ever again one last question about the stem cell uh there's no limit to how many you can get They're, they've uh, made you feel damn near normal again right yeah. you're gonna do one more it seems to me like there there's no there's not a uh allergic reaction that's gonna happen no. it's our own bodies it's the, stuff the, from our yeah, own the, bodies. the only thing i would say if you were in an unsanitary environment or something yes. happened you could have a risk of infection absolutely and I, I heard hulk hogan was talking about that he went down see the, these things that was just in a bad he had cells transported and th that thing was bad from the start and going down to mexico like that was my concern going down to colombia and not knowing everything down there is exactly how it was run here in the united states facility wise and stem cells by nature though are, are healing are so clean it's really really hard to get an infection actually doing stem cells but i was told the same thing like getting in the risk for my back it's a high stressful situation i was told and i'm getting five of my discs done at a time that if you get a, a, a an infection in your disc you're dead there's no there's there's no there's no maybe like you're dead there's it's and I had to go through that five or six times here of mentally preparing myself going in. And it, 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 it's a stressful situation. But like I told you, high risk, high reward. Um, I really, really want back what I had. And uh, I, I was I was prepared to take that risk. And I was assured, you know, with the stem cells and the cleanliness of everything here, that, that there was very little to worry about. But they do have to let you know that there's always a risk anytime you're surgery or injections inside the yeah. body like that. So... Yes, we do, man. <laughs> Unbelievable, man. Titans in here. You know to go off, dude. We ready to do this stuff? We're ready to rock, man. You ready to rock, Camera camp? guys, ready to roll. Mike, you ready? Ready. Ready. This is free to hot box and exclusively available on Apple Podcasts and Podcast One. This is the Steve Austin Show. Hey, you said something a while ago that really uh, piqued my interest. I didn't follow up on it. You said you'd uh, trademark the Feed Me More and yeah. the uh, Ryback the big guy. Big guy. the big guy. The big guy. Yeah. Okay. Hey, man, I was very smart because a lot of people don't have the wherewithal to do that. Yeah. And I was surprised that, you know, once you trademarked it, they kept using it because they didn't invent it. Yeah. See, that's one of my things. And this is something, too, uh, probably uh, I created that when I had nothing, when I was released from WWE, when I was younger, living in Louisville, Kentucky on a drunken night and uh, came up with Ryback and the big guy and feed me more. And it, it meant a lot to me that I'd had that. And I I think too that stuff like discussions that, you know, you have to have with Vince over certain things on, on certain things and what they mean to you. And my relationship was strained with them from the start. And I've talked about this. I don't trust them. I never will unless it's in writing. And then I, I've had, you know, they make me force me to drop a multi-million dollar lawsuit on my ankle when I was red hot. And I trusted them. And the moment I dropped that lawsuit was when they started playing the games with me because they knew. And that was an open and shut case. I was told by my attorneys, do not drop this. You're not. And, and I, I go, no, they want me to drop it. I was in my main event feud with Punk. And, and I, I, because they said it would look bad for the company to do that. And so I have severe trust issues with them already that were strained that, and I've had enough discussions and different things with, with Hunter and Vince where 
uh, Flex Magazine wanted me on the cover and met with them in New York, and Hunter and Vince said no, they wouldn't let me do it. I, I've had things that, that have caused Why not? Because, again, it, go, it goes back to the ankle situation. It's always – it's been – you look at you go back and I, I could talk about this all day long and you go back and look at my when I got red hot. Why would you pull the plug on that or have that guy lose seven pay-per-views in a row when he's the number two merchandise seller? And I tell people it all goes back to my ankle situation. It, it was all one big game. The carrot was always going to be dangled. It was never. And that's because of my personal situation with them and things that have happened. So when I saw what was going on with all of that. It made it a very easy decision. I, I, I wrote alone, Steve, and I love being around the guys, but I love learning. I listen to books. I listen to four or five, six books a week sometimes. I'm a dickhead when it comes to that. Like, I love learning, man. And I started learning about business and different things. And I realized at some point along the way, I go, these dumb motherfuckers didn't trademark any of this shit. So I, and I went and I made a few phone calls and I trademarked Feed Me More and the Big Guy. What they did with Ryback is they actually trademarked Ryback. I was told by my attorney when I left, um, to legally go change my name to Ryback, and I would still be able to use the name, uh, in which I'm dealing with this right now with them, Steve. They actually, the trademark expired. It was set to expire this year, this past year. They refiled for it on the last day. I now, and I was just told this a couple weeks ago, I now have to spend between one hundred and two hundred thousand dollars and $200,000 to cancel the Ryback trademark so they can't use it anymore. They filed for it for online services with everything I'm doing with the YouTube and the podcast, as well as for entertainment, for wrestling. Um, the good news is, though, it is my legal name. So if I go anywhere and wrestle, if I go to AEW, I could be I could be the big guy Ryback Reeves. It's my legal name. Um, I could still be called Ryback, but we just may have to have Reeves on the screen, and they won't be able to stop that. But that's I'm now I got it's delayed for seven more months. We just filed an extension and then I got to go through the whole trademark attorney with them and, and canceled their Ryback trademark because I don't want them having anything of mine. It, it really it's very personal with everything. So, so. are you going to legally change your name to Ryback? It already it's been. I, I changed it the moment I left. I, oh, so I, what, I, what does it say on your if you're getting a plane ticket? I'm Ryback Reeves now on everything. Really? Yeah. And so and I, I joke a lot of people don't understand. You know, because you know, I think two people here, like, oh, you know, the whole warrior shit. And then I, I, I'm nothing like that. It's if my name, I tell people this, if my fucking wrestling name was Grizzly Bear, I wasn't going to change my name to Grizzly Bear. <laughs> you know? But it was it, Ryback. Grizzly Ryan, Bear 316. <laughs> <laughs> I looked at it, Ryback Ryan. It's close enough. I yeah. go by Ryan with all my, my friends and people that know me. It was all strictly solely for business. Moving along here, uh, I want to ask you about what, what you're doing as far as your workout program now. Hold it. You said on a drunken night while I go, do you still drink? Yeah, yeah. I'll have, like, I do, because I do the YouTube. I'll do, like, a little uh, little drinking show on YouTube where I read negative comments or positive comments every seven to ten days. I do, I, I'm all about balance, man. You got to live life a little bit, you know? What do you drink? Uh, I, I love Honey Jack. I love Jack. I love, I, I'll do a little vodka from time to time. Uh, I'm a big red wine blend guy, different times. But I've learned to try to, you know, I, uh, it's all a moderation at these points. It's like you go too far over on, uh, these days. It's like I'm 38. I'm still young, but yeah. there's definitely how busy I am. I, I get up five, six o'clock every morning, and I can't down a bottle of, uh, of Tito's like I used to. <laughs> no, man, I can't either. But God dang, I, I got to get some cardio going on over here because, man, it's uh, January, what, uh, yeah. 18th, 19th as we're speaking. I got some projects coming up, so I got I to gotta stop making the Broken Skull Ranch margaritas because, man, all that sugar and shit will catch up with your ass oh, yeah. you, you, it's hard to out cardio you know you know what i got i actually i got my own gym here i built i got gym dumbbells to 150s i just bought i got a i got the elliptical machine i got uh, an assault bike the assault for fucking yep. and i just bought one of those uh those dead mills the fucking sprinters yep. with the curb man i tell you what steve i do that every other day when i i'll do one day of, of normal cardio after my workout and then i when i do my hard conditioning days like that's my one thing i've always kept my conditioning from so for me I learned to make money in wrestling when I realized that I have something special with my body and that if I could have conditioning with that, I could be untouchable. And that's helped me and allowed me to have the intensity that I had. I am I am a, a cardio like freak when it comes to that because the more muscle you have, the more oxygen you burn. Man, I do that dead mill. I do round after round after round. That shit cranks your metabolism up so good, though. It makes it where it makes having drinks a little easier when you do do that. But you got to you got to stay on top of it. That's the, the the hard thing. Man, that's one of the things I was going to ask you about because uh, you know I I just 
assuming uh, because you're such a, a big dude, I know you lift a lot of heavy weights. You, you were a physique guy. Uh, I just figured you were like allergic to cardio because, oh. you know, so many guys who are looking for that mass and that power will stay away from it just because, uh, you know, they can add too much cardio if trying to yeah. gain muscle. Give me your cardio routine. I've always been up. So I, especially WWE, that was always the thing that makes me laugh when I would read people would say, Ryback can't wrestle long matches. I do easily 15, 20, 25 on live events every night, high intensity beginning to end. A lot of people don't realize this. When I, I couldn't breathe through my nose my entire WWE career. I, I had it got broken my first year in wrestling. I never got it fixed. When I left there, I actually got my nose fixed. And I didn't realize how much it was actually making it harder on me. Uh, on breathing because I was I was I was a mouth breather so I think a lot of people would see me breathing through my mouth in my matches I couldn't breathe through my nose though so they assumed that I was tired I very rarely would get tired out there at different points unless it just extreme situations or if I was sick a little bit here and there but I on the road Steve up there I would do 100 burpees every day after my workout every on, on the live events five days a week and you could talk to the guys they would see me I always said with great amount of muscle comes great responsibility and I was I I took great pride in that that having functional muscle I'm anti drug steroid I, I I'm so against all that bullshit I've naturally always been a big guy so but I think you have to it's like anything else conditioning I always say conditioning creates confidence so and for me I'm very confident because I know I can back it up and and to me it's a very powerful thing that if you could start a match and finish a match with the same amount of energy I think that's a really cool thing so. I've always, no matter what like elliptical shit I do, there's days I, I do 60 on the elliptical, just level 25, just to burn the fucking calories to keep my metabolism going. But when I do my hard conditioning, man, battle ropes for fucking 10 minutes straight, hard fucking, I do the assault bike, I'll do two, three, four rounds of Tabata, 20 seconds on, 10 seconds off. I got fucking sleds I hook up to myself out there, throw a bunch of weight on, and I do dead sprints with the fucking hundreds of pounds on my uh, being dragged behind me. To go out to that ring and to, to have be fucking high intensity and to, to flex and scream at the top of your lungs, your conditioning has to be three times the regular size guy to do that and to maintain that, that intensity throughout. So I'm obsessed with it, man. I put videos up. People, I, I laugh. I go, I've been doing this shit from the beginning, you know, but I think some people saw me doing like the short squash matches early and they don't, they don't understand. That's all part of the job. That's how you get over. You know, I, that's, you go out there and you do short matches and you fucking do some cool things. And, and, but that wasn't, if you asked me to go out and do 30 and me and Cena would routinely go out and do 30 on live events. And I, I dare you to ask anybody that it was reactions there from beginning to end, intensity there from beginning to end. So, hey, uh, I want to ask you about the uh, UFC 246 in yeah. just a second. But just as far as your weight training program, uh, I know you've always been a, a, a gym fanatic. Yeah. So just let, kind of give me your training split. Don't go crazy, but just give me your training split. How, how often are you hitting everything? Well, I got the gym here. I train at home almost every day now. So uh, I do essentially a, a body part a week as far as, and some things I do twice a week. Uh, but I, I, I like training heavy. I've always loved training heavy. Uh, and I had the last few years, I had to do a lot of machine weights, a lot of air machines, just to keep my sanity while I was trying to figure out my problems. Um, I've recently, I started training with Nick Best, one of the world. She's on that strongest man in history. Big Jack that looks, we, he gets recognized. I get recognized for him. He gets recognized for me. We live 12 minutes apart from each other here in Vegas. We never knew it. I'll do, I, I've taken some of their principles in strongman training um, as far as core stuff. I do a lot of ab stuff, and I, it, it's, I've, I've cut down on the volume. I was doing a lot of high volume for a while, and I think, too, as wrestlers, what happens is we get injured, and we start working around our injuries, and we start training light. And, and what I have found is what we're doing is it's actually hurting us. We need to stick with the machine, I mean, with the free weights, and the, we got to do things – um, and push ourselves still, it's just cutting down on the volume. It, 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 it's getting warmed up properly. And like me, I avoided a lot of free weights the last few years. And what I found is a lot of my shoulder problems and my lat problems were because I wasn't using those little supporting muscles around. So it, to me now, it's very strategic. I, I get warmed up. I keep my workouts anywhere from anywhere from 10 to 15 sets now, no more. Legs, 20. 20 is kind of that number research-wise, anything over 20 sets kind of diminishing returns for a body so, part one body, for a body part, part a day. yeah 
Yeah, and so now it's just going out there. I'm going, I'm training now, Steve, to have not be in pain and to be able to be as strong as I could possibly be and be functional without hurting myself. And I got like Viking press shit for my shoulder. I do a lot of like landmine free weight stuff where I'm using my core now. To me, it's building our body up. And again, if, if my shoulders, it's taking days off. Uh, like I, I the other day I worked, had a really hard arm workout and I was doing those ring dips and I kind of, my shoulder, I, I didn't like the way it was feeling. And I go, you know what? I, I need to take a day off. And it's recognizing now taking whole days off, not going and doing an hour of cardio on a day off, taking the whole day off and working hard when I work. And I've learned, and for me, I have a really hard time doing that. I've been working out since I was like 11 years old, hours a day. And, and it's like, I love pushing myself. So recovery is very big. Okay, just a, a simple chest workout. If you're doing 15 sets, yeah. are you going to do something traditional like okay, bench press. start okay, so, as you say start off with bench presses, then yep. use the flat bench flies and then you end up with incline. Well, would that be a workout that you would do? Yeah, and I just did chest the other day, so what I'm doing now is I couldn't bench for for 5 years because of my shoulder. Yep. Nick and all these guys helped me with my form. I've now learned I built my lat up that was atrophied. So I started off, I worked my got my warm up in. I did five working sets of bench press on the thing. I went over, I did six sets of working dumbbell inclines on the dumb on the dumbbells for 11. And then I did uh, four sets of these flies with uh, kettlebells where I'm not, I, I purposely can't go as heavy because my shoulder will grind on those still. So I do it with perfect form without letting my shoulder grind for that for 15. And then I finished with two sets of those uh, perfect push ups just wrapped out at the end just to keep my shoulder and everything. So that was 17 sets done for chest. Hey, do you ever do kettlebell swings? Yeah, the, the, between the legs there. Yeah, the yeah, because yeah, you're such yeah. a core guy. I was just wondering if you'd uh, delved into that because I'd been in a gym for years and years and years. Not not like you, but, you know, I put in my time. I've Absolutely. always trained like a bodybuilder. Yeah. I've always been kind of a, a wrestler body type. But sure enough, you know, I watch these guys do these kettlebell swings or gals. And I'm like, what a bunch of shit. They're just swinging that weight back and forth between their legs. Dude, I bought a 40 pound uh, kettlebell and I started swinging at some bitch. It blew me up and yeah. literally, I don't know, 30 swings. So it, it's a really good movement, but, but it blew my doors off because I was thinking, surely this is horse shit. Yeah. All we know is what we've been told and from fitness and things have evolved and especially with social media now and they got people inventing workouts and some of it. But man, the, the things a lot of these people can do these days. I'm blown away by, I see shit. Like, you see these fuckers on the bars out there doing that. I'm like, holy shit. <laughs> it, it's uh, it take it, it's a, it incorporates conditioning with, with like whole body movements, man. It zaps you. Hey man, tell me a little bit about your podcast conversation with the big guy. Yeah. And I started that a few years ago, man. And it, it, it evolved in my, and the guy I actually did it with it. It's been a great learning experience for me. My main goal with when I started that, I, I the podcast and I talked to the Gary Vaynerchuk and he just said, and he, I, I really, really, he's helped me tremendously with letting go of that wrestling mentality and having a very entrepreneurship mindset. Everything that I'm doing with my Feed Me More Nutrition line, everything becomes a sales funnel for Feed Me More Nutrition. So I have, I'm on every social media thing, what I don't want to be necessarily. And I've learned to just accept the positives of them. And I get up early every morning and do hours of social media work. But having a podcast was a way for me. I was really, really unhappy, Steve. And I think you, in the wrestling bubble, I think we can sometimes get in the wrestling audience can for good or bad, get so caught up in the persona that we play that they, they they really, it's really hard to have an identity outside of that. And so for me, I knew there was, there was a lot of negative stuff going on. And I know all I know is people that meet me in real life always like me, but yet there was this hate that was created online. Um, and some of that had to do with the CM Punk stuff and his, he has a large fan base and that whole deal. And then the company putting out the things I go, I just need to put out as much content of me being me. Uh, that's the only way I could fight this. And people that search out for me will be able to realize that that stuff isn't true. And for me, I just, it's a way to have fun. I wanted people to know the real Ryan Reeves, Ryback, whatever you want. I'm sarcastic 99% of the time. And that 1% that I'm serious, I'm as fucking serious as anybody on the planet. But I like to laugh. I like to have fun. I don't live in fear. I, I'm not politically correct. But I just don't fuck. I, I love working for myself. So the show evolved from me having fun. I had a show with Phoenix Marie. The porn star was on it for a good year. I have developed relationships with some of those. It's just being in Vegas. And then I wanted to eventually evolve the show. I always liked the Joe Rogan show because Joe is, is very... 
Joe is a badass, but he's very humble still, I feel. And I feel MMA does that to you when you when you work through the ranks and train. He has a very open mindset, and he likes to learn. And by having that mindset, it creates for a very uh, interesting show to learn. So that's kind of the approach I took uh, with pro wrestling and keeping my bread and butter and having the wrestling report every week. And now I have doctors. I have people from health and fitness, people from wrestling, where it, it, I'm trying to learn. And, I've, Steve, it's helped me. I've had people on this show that I've the, the, the growth for me it just mentally the last three years – from doing this show has made the show worth it to me. And it's something I want, I look at, I tell people, it's kind of a diary of my life. And I plan on doing this as long as I can, to be quite frank with you, because I, it's just, I enjoy the not being on this shit for fucking an hour or two and having a real conversation with somebody that we don't get to have that much these days. So, Hey man, it sounds like your feed me more nutrition has really taken off. Yeah. How, when did you first start that? And, and what, I, I guess in your quest for you know building muscle and staying fit, yeah, you, know, you decided to come out with your own line of nutrition. So it's something I've been passionate about from day one. I, I, my mom was always into the herbs, and she would always be doing her little Jane Fonda workouts when I was a kid. So that kind of was like engraved, engraved in my brain at a very young age, and seeing all these different herbs in the in the cupboards. And so, and the internet came out when I was in high school and I would just spend hours researching. I was always fascinated like pro wrestling. I've always, I, I grew up loving pro wrestling and I always, I, I'll, I'll, I'll never forget being a kid and learning about working out and different weight training programs and started applying this stuff. And I would spend hours every day and supplements was a naturally just went along with it. That being on the road, my big thing with all of this was uh, in WWE and developmental I started having these side effects. Uh, my vision started going blurry. I started when I would wake up in the morning feeling really groggy, no matter how much I slept. And I never used to feel that way. I would get little blackouts when I would stand up and I go, what the fuck's going on with me? This isn't, this isn't normal. And I started researching online and seeing that it was aspartame and sucralose, the artificial sweeteners. These are really common side effects. And the problem is if you have maybe a little diet Coke here or there, you might not be prone to it. And everyone has different levels. I was consuming so much of this stuff with all the diet sodas, all my protein shakes had it. I was putting fucking Splenda in my coffee all day, drinking the energy drinks. I was consuming a, a massive amount of artificial sweeteners. So it, right then I started making my own supplements at like 20 something years old. I would make, create formulas online. I've always been big on... I want to be the absolute best. I invest in my body. I don't want to take drugs. I don't want to do anything. I want to fucking whatever natural way I could do this to be my absolute best, to gain any edge over the competition. I want to invest in my body. So I started it just, I'm not a scientist. I'm not, I'm not, it's trial and error of trying different things that have worked for me. So when I was in WWE kind of had the issue whole going on with the feed me more shit. I wanted to do it while I was there in my private would have made it a hell of a lot easier to, to start it up. Uh, when all that happened and I knew I was leaving and the health stuff going on, I just, I go, I'm going full board with, board with this. I'm taking a chance on myself. I, and I took my own money, hundreds of thousands of dollars. And I knew what I, I had everything. I had my game plan. I had my list of supplements for fucking 15 different things. And I, I started calling companies. I finally found the company that I was comfortable with and started coming out with these formulas with stevia and monk fruit, no artificial sweeteners. But like, so just so to give you an example, Steve, my sleep aid, uh, conveniently called GTS go to sleep for my good buddy, Phil, the, but it, it is a great name for a supplement. I came up with that because on the road and you know this, you're drinking coffee, fucking driving every night. You go from entertaining thousands of people. You're living on cloud nine. You're all wired up and you're, you're like, you, you, you got to drink that coffee to get to the next town and your head's fucking bobbing up and down on the road, fucking parking for 10 minutes to take a little breather before you get back. Don't get hit by a semi truck. And I was drinking NyQuil and, and taking Benadryl. And again, I go, that's, you do that here and there. There's not a problem. I go, fuck, I've been doing this for three years. You know, this isn't, this isn't normal. It's not good for you to in, internally. So I started looking into herbs and I created the sleep aid by necessity for me of mixing and matching different supplements individually. And I'd have all these pill cases on the road. I had ones for my fat burner. I had ones for my natural test booster. I had one for my sleep aid. And so these are the formulas I've actually created and used. And then I've just now mass produced them for people. And what's happening is people are getting really, really good results. We use more ingredients than any of these other companies. My costs are a lot higher. My profit margins are a little smaller on that. But what you get is you actually get supplements that do what the label says. 
and we're getting, we get a lot of five-star reviews from people. And I just signed a deal with a fulfillment company. I've busted my ass for three years. I've done everything, customer service. I've been mailing the orders, fucking getting up at 5 a.m. every day. And now everything's just been signed over and uh, we're going to be able to scale massively. Just got approved for Amazon UK, Mexico, and Canada, where I got nice followings over there. It's been a really good deal, man. Uh, uh, and it, it honestly, it's given me a lot of pleasure meeting people. I've met people that have lost 120 pounds because they listened to the podcast and started taking my supplements and eating how I eat. And I'm just like, fuck, man. You know, it's great to get a compliment for somebody for providing entertainment for pro wrestling. It's a great feeling, but it's a whole other feeling when somebody's entire life has been changed for, for you just doing a bullshit show and, and, and selling the stuff that's worked for you. It, it's really, man, it, 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 it gets me. The GTS natural sleep formula. Is that a shoot? Does it work? I don't sleep worth a fuck. I take it every night, Steve. I got it sitting behind me back there. There's... It is. It's the real deal. And again, I say with everything with people, you never know how a supplement's going to react. There's always people. You're never going to please 100 percent of the people uh, in business. There's always going to be the rare exception to the rule or people that have a disorder or something. You never know. Uh, it's never done me wrong. And the people that have used it, I've, I've there's reviews online of people that nothing has worked and that's worked for them. So it's again, I'll send you a bottle, let you try it for yourself so you can see it, it's the real deal. One other question about the brain feed formula. Is that similar to an alpha brain? Very similar to an alpha brain but i what i one of the main like i love alpha brain i love everything on it is one of the, the better companies out there uh, as far as because there's some uh, big companies i i don't agree with the way they do business some of them on some things but again you got to respect a business that 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 does well but i've added uh, a different ingredient called theocrine uh theocrine in it that is actually enhances the effects of like caffeine and asian ginseng and some different things it's a stimulant without that stimulant feeling and I'll stack that with like my wake up unlimited energy pre-workout. And man, I take it every morning. It, it's, it, it does it good, but it's very similar to an alpha brain. Yes. Hey, what are you doing with respect to your diet now? Because, uh, I'm, I'm back in the day. I mean, you, how many calories were you taking in back in the day to, to maintain yeah. what? 290. Yeah. So I'm 300 pounds now. I was like three, over 300 the other day. And you're going to, you're going to lose your shit when I tell you this. I'm, uh, I am now plant-based. I've been that for 35 fucking days. I had, uh, this is, I had Austin Aries on my show who lives in Vegas also here. And, uh, I've tried the keto diet, Steve. I, and back in the day, WWE, just to answer your question, I was eating, it was a shoot eight to 10 large meals a day. And the, the way, the reason why I, massive amounts of steak and chicken and carbs and, the, and all healthy brown rice, it was, it was not eating no, no cookies, none of that shit. But I was doing so much cardio and going out there performing every night, the energy expenditure, I had to consume a large amount of calories. And then when I left WWE, that was actually one of the things I did start adjusting my diet. One, my workout intensity went down because of my injuries. And so I'm doing, I'm not working out nearly the intensity that I was doing. And on top of that, I no longer was wrestling five nights a week and burning that the same. So I had to alter my calories because I, I noticed when I left, my body fat shot up a little bit on my sides. I caught those Ric Flair love handles I never had. They fucking made their fucking ugly way. I go, what the fuck? I still had my abs, but I go, I'm going to have to adjust my calories a little bit here. And yeah, because yeah, you're not burning them off in the end of yeah. the ring with that intensity. Yeah. So, and then I, I, I'm big on, I've, man, I'll try, I, my big thing is, we, me, you can go and you can read any research study. We can find anything we want to find to convince ourselves. My yeah. thing is, you just try it, and you go get blood work done, you see how you feel, and we, you go by that, and if it works for you, great, if it doesn't, great. So, I did the keto diet for a year, my muscle mass went down, my body fat went up. I had a bunch of different te lab tests done, I had genetic testing done. They told me I don't process fatty meats really well. Um, I have this APO gene E34 where I'm at risk for cardiac disease and Alzheimer's because I don't process high fats well. So the way that you protect yourself from that is you don't eat a lot of animal fat or a lot of fat. So I knew right then the keto diet's probably not the best diet for me. I've always done really well on a, like a Mediterranean carb-based diet, keeping my fats lower and my protein a little higher. Oh, and then when I want to really, really tighten up, I will lower my carbs. Plant-based. Yeah. 
C.T. Fletcher just announced on uh, his Instagram. I follow him on Instagram. Uh, he's now plant-based, and he's. I sent him a text message as soon as I saw his video. I said, dude, I said, what are you doing? Uh, and I, I said, is this, a, is this for real? He goes, yeah, Steve, I've been plant-based for about three months now. I said, how do you feel? And he goes, I got so much energy. And yeah. I've heard so many people tell me this. You talk to me about it because I'm looking right at you. 35 days plant-based. What? How are you feeling and what are you eating to get the calories? So uh, I had Austin Aries on. He has his book, Food Fight. And he, he the guy, I'd never met him before. And we, we actually did a workout video together. He came over with Chris Van Vliet. And, uh, and it ended up just hitting it off with him really well. And I found that he, I think sometimes we hear like the word vegan or vegetarian. And it's just, a, it's an asshole word. It kind of just doesn't, it just, you just kind of, it just never sat well with me, which I'll never use that word. But he was so non-confrontational with how he presented, how he got to that decision. And again, it comes to down to the factory farming and how animals are treated. It was one thing, Steve, and I think we all, we live in this world where we're kind of a, a product of big business, our, our generations of, we've just kind of done what's been sold to us over the years. And we've been told, this is what you do. This is what we eat. And my thing is, is our ancestors, I believe we're okay. We've eaten meat from the beginning of time. My thing is, I just don't think we were eating it in the amounts that were being sold today. Uh, and I don't believe we need to have it every meal necessarily. I started, I got a few books on it. I had him on the podcast. I read his book. I watched the Game Changers uh, deal on Netflix on, on that. Um, I heard that Joe Rogan had a guy on that supposedly debunked the film. I went and I listened to it. Joe then had the guy from the film come on who then debunked that guy for three and a half hours. And Joe literally just said he was sorry. I think he pulled the episode down of it. I go, so my thing was like, oh, you know what? I'm going to try this. And I'm gonna get I'm gonna get blood work done at the eight week mark, and I'm gonna get I'm gonna I'm gonna gauge it from there, and I'm gonna see how I feel. And anytime you start a new diet, energy levels can't adjust. Like when you go keto, you you get tired. You gotta you gotta learn to give things time and patience. That magic word patience always is is, is a key word in all of this. Um, I looked at it, and I so I'm very I, I talked to you about the cardio aspect. I saw that the. I talked to doctors that there was a doctor that recently passed away from my doctor here was telling me about him. He was a heart surgeon. He was 105 years old. He ended up going vegetarian halfway into his life because he found that every patient that he operated on that lived a vegetarian lifestyle, their, their arteries and their blood vessels were soft and pliable. And this is, and that they, you know, people that eat meat, they were always hard and they had, even if they were quote unquote healthy, there was internal changes that he had seen where he realized that this stuff isn't good in high amounts, or at least the amounts that we're, we're being told we need to eat. So I'm very fascinated from it from one, when I saw that meat in the amount, I was eating pounds of steak and beef every day, that it causes massive inflammation and it can impede blood flow and different things. I just said, you know what? I'm gonna give this shit a try and I'm just gonna see, and Steve, it has been absolutely phenomenal. I've actually, I'm over 300 pounds for the first time in my life. I never was able to get over 300. I've improved my muscle muscle density on that. I've been training my energy. My cardio has gone up in the last week, uh, four and a half weeks of doing this from where it was. And, and like, I'm noticing in the, my veins and my forearms are like a little bit better. It's bull. It sounds like bullshit, but the diet it's eating all the things that we normally eat, eating brown rice or white rice. I eat my vegetables, my broccoli. I, I, and I do, I'm doing, I'll do cheese still. I'm not doing any milk and I'll do a little bit of organic eggs here and there as well. And I got my grass fed protein, which is a whey protein isolate, but it's grass fed. I also ordered a plant-based protein. I actually ordered the one CT does because I'm going to come out with one myself on that because I, I'm really, this, it's truly, you can have a full amino acid profile with the different, with the pea protein and using brown rice. And, and the hemp, you're able to complete, you can have a pro, uh, full profile uh, protein still. We both watched uh, UFC 246 last yeah. night. Uh, what'd you think about the main event? Absolutely loved it. I, uh, man, there's, I, that's the feeling I wish I get with pro wrestling sometimes that with those big fight feels with Connor, you see all the celebrities. It's like the cool thing. Everybody who's everybody comes into town. And for me, and it was talking to you, man, that power of being hungry, the guys made a lot of money. And uh, I'm, I'm a big fan of his, and he's working with guys like Tony Robbins. He's big on that whole law of attraction and, and thoughts become things. But he, at the end of the day, you got to put in the fucking work. And so to me, it's such a great fucking story because you have this guy that has all this money. And it's he's overcome adversity multiple times throughout his career where he's come back, where we've seen in that sport, you look at Ronda, like she was unable to do it doesn't take away from she was the fucking baddest woman on the planet but in that sport man it's not like wrestling it, it's your, your your career could be done on one bad night 
and because it fucks you up mentally. And you got people that are that sport, and Dana's done a great job, like Vince, keeping people at bay until you make a certain level of money that, you know, you're fighting for. Those people are fighting for their life literally out there. So you got a guy, man, this story is he's going back. He's competing against one of the greatest cowboy, man, most victories in UFC. He can't take a night off with that guy. He, he's still proven he can fucking still go. And is, is Connor going to be able to get hungry enough? Does he want that Khabib rematch? Is it how – like and so to me it was getting to watch that story unfold out there and he delivered man some people were like oh 40 seconds i go it doesn't matter the length of the fight it's the fucking emotion i was fucking i was jacked up at the end of that thing i couldn't believe it i mean the way he was throwing those shoulders and connecting with cowboy broke his nose started bleeding i, I was like that's the damnedest thing i'd ever seen done i mean you so see john man. jones with all his you know reverse elbows and the yeah. way he can attack and you think he's attacking this direction it's a whole different ball game when he spins around from another direction but this was just straight up and i've seen guys do that a little bit of stuff with their shoulders sometimes dirty boxing but the way he did it and the way he yeah. employed it and it Twice. Dude, I mean, it rocked him. It fucked him up. And then the head right kick. start. Unbelievable. The, the fact that they had, they obviously, to me, that's the cool thing about these guys are at such a level. They're watching film and they see something in camp and they go, we have an opening here, this position. This is how this guy likes to start. And then coming up with something that we've never seen like that. I've never seen it. And he went with one and he missed and then he followed it up and he got him on the second. Fucked him up right from the start, discombobulated him, hit him with that fucking head kick, got him down. It, that guy, he looks like he hasn't missed a beat, and he's out there running a fucking major whiskey promotion now, traveling all over the world, has a wife and kids, and I'm like, that is badass, that to be able to come back and do that, because I'm telling you, man, you see it like a Floyd Mayweather, they make all this money. He's Connor's really good, though, like I said, at creating that hunger in his mind. It's not... It, the money's great, and he does it for them. He has the money, but he's able to convince himself that he's still fighting for his life. And to me, that that's it showed. I just didn't see that fight going down like that. Now, I, I, uh, I thought he would win the fight because the yeah. Cowboy's been knocked out the last two fights. And, I mean, man, that guy's been through some wars. And he's got some more wars left in him. Absolutely. And I love him. I give him all the respect in the world. Same. I just did not see that happening with those shoulder strikes like that. I mean, that was uncanny. Hey, dude, how'd you get knocked out or almost knocked out? And dude hit me with the shoulder. He didn't even have a chance. It was he was lit from the start, and it, I tell you, man, the whole just watching that. I was watching UFC last night. And I think they're missing the boat even on a bit. On they, they have they can do pro wrestling better than pro wrestling in a way. I feel like they there's still room for them to improve, like on the entrances. Like Connor had a nice elaborate entrance. I go fuck. They should do this for everybody. But what you will do is you'll actually start creating brands for the fighters which I think they kind of keep everything at a certain level there until you're at a certain level. And Connor's brilliant at all that. But like, I, man, I watched those, Steve, I, and I, this is nothing against wrestling. It, 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 I, I get so much enjoyment because for me, pro wrestling is so scripted now. It, it kind of has taken the enjoyment. And it was one of the reasons I didn't enjoy it there is, is reading lines from 35 year old virgins in the back that don't know how to write for an alpha male. I don't, it just, I can't relate to it. And you take away that excitement for me, but these guys, they go out and they really do it. I feel like they, the, production wise they could really with those entrances and things i think really step it up even more yeah you can't do a full-blown no know, just everything but the kitchen sink entrance on everybody because it's going to take up too much time but yeah i think they're, they're doing a really good job one of the things that i've liked in, in recent uh pay-per-views they might have been going back as far as a few months but for a while there i I always liked when the guys came out with their individual walkout shirts and there was personality and it was branding and, you know, yeah. And they had their little banners they'd roll down on side the cage yeah. and they took that all away. And everybody's coming out with opposing colors, matching colors in the fight with Reebok. I was like, nothing against the Reebok brand. It's their fantastic brand. That's fine. I'm just saying they took all the personality. Yeah. I was like, man, what the fuck is going on? I want to see what somebody's all about. Yep. And so now at least, you know, they've got these branded t-shirts back and everything. Thing looks a little bit more relaxed, but they were, they were all trying to make them wear these fucking uniforms, and I was like, hey, you're killing me. You're yeah. killing me. Well, if you see, the cool thing, too, is, well, Connor, I, I popped for the, is seeing the proper whiskey on the, on the octagon. That guy, man, that's why he has the attitude he has. 
he's got them in a position. He he plays it up all the way, and it makes him everything he does more special. But on your note, this is something I think that I had to learn this. This is the power of social media now and branding and why and having a YouTube channel and having all the social media channels is no matter what – because no, at the end of the day, it's a job and you're working for a promoter. And that's the, the their infrastructure, whether it's Vince, whether it's them, whether it's AEW. You're, you're t- making money for a promoter. Social media is the one way we can be exactly who and what we want to be and put out our message and get our following. And then you, when you go, to, you go to work, you go to work because that's what they want. And that but Connor's in such a position where he has them, where he's able to do what he kind of, you know, brand himself exceptionally well. He, he's There's nobody better. I, I give him a lot of credit on everything he's done. Tell everybody where they can find you because you, you have your YouTube channel. You've got FeedMeMore.com, Instagram, Twitter, uh, your show, which drops weekly. Uh, tell everybody about where they can find all your stuff. Yeah, so for Feed Me More Nutrition, it's feedmemore.com. We're available on Amazon as well for that. And we do ship internationally on the website. My podcast, Conversation with the Big Guy Ryback, all podcast platforms. And we're at YouTube, youtube.com slash Ryback TV. I do a lot of bullshit videos, me doing, I do hot challenges. I'm eating the spiciest peppers in the world. I didn't realize I was even good at it, but I like mentally challenging myself. And so we do a lot of fun bullshit on there where people get to see my real personality a lot more on that, on the YouTube end. And I get 200,000 subscribers in six months. So we're growing nicely. And uh, it allowed me to have a TV audience once again, uh, outside of the other social media channels, but the big guy Ryback22 on Instagram or Ryback22 on Twitter, and then you can kind of find the rest of it from there. If you are feeling healthier, uh, all of the uh, stem cell stuff that you've yeah. done, and at still a young enough age that to get back into the ring for a couple of more years or a couple of more matches, is wrestling in your future is what I'm asking. Yeah, and I, I've looked at it. So my, my outlook on pro wrestling, too, has changed as I've learned to make money without pro wrestling. Vince, and this is not, he's a great businessman. But being on the road five days a week, it, it's not the best. And when he took over the company from his dad, and I'm reading Backlund's book, and you can see the times change. Vince kind of looks at the talent more as a disposable cattle, I kind of uh, in, a, in a different way to kind of fuel his goals and his mission. Uh, I don't know if I ever would ever uh, put myself back in that position to go back five days a week ever again. And with AEW being once a week, I think it's much more friendlier uh, to – my business ventures I have going on, they have major television. It is the number one promotion in my mind that I would like to work with when I am ready. But I've been very vocal about my injuries. Everybody knows I'm documenting everything on, on everything with YouTube and letting people see every week the progress that I've made, the strength gains that I've made. And the goal is, is just I've been very, I'm very transparent with this. The goal is I got to physically get myself back to where I know I'm not going to hurt myself. My back is completely fine now. My shoulder, I just need to get it a little bit stronger just so I know that I'm out there fucking I, – I, there's. I've just spent three years and a lot of money to get myself. And so I, it, patience again. I'm at that, that light at the end of the tunnel. I just got a little more patient. But once – and I, I get my body to where it is, I'll get back in the ring. I got – there's here. Austin's here. There's guys. I'll get back in the ring. I'll get myself ready. If I have to go do an, in, an, an indie match or two to show everybody that I'm okay and that I can go, and then I'll kind of let things unfold the way that goes there. But I have no interest of doing four or five nights a week and going back to that lifestyle because they take your soul when you do that for too long. Man, I tell you what, uh, I've really enjoyed talking to you. It's good to see you. It looks like you're doing great. Let's catch up again because I'd love to talk to you uh, on another podcast about the state of the business. So let's pick it back up on another date. Yes, sir. I'm all for it. Right back. Appreciate you. Absolutely, Steve. Thank you for having me. All right, everybody, give me the go-home cue. It's time to wrap up the podcast and ride off in the sunset. But before I do that, I want to thank my guest, Ryback, for joining me on the show. Guys, busy as hell. Check him out uh, at all the places where we listed his social media, his website, YouTube series. He's uh, busy as hell, and has got a lot of good things going his way. So congrats, Ryback, on all the success and the hard work that you put in. I appreciate talking to you. I might check into the stem cell stuff myself. Hey, don't forget to rate and review the Steve Austin Show on Apple Podcasts and now Spotify to tell your friends to check us out. If you want to reach me here on the podcast, send an email to questions at steveaustinshow.com. Hey man, Broken Skull IPA continues to blaze its way across the United States of America. Big expansion in for 2020. Thanks everybody out there on the East Coast for being so positive uh, to our arrival over there. People are going uh, crazy for this stuff. Uh, It's selling out everywhere. Massachusetts, New Jersey, 
New York, thank you very much for the support. Trying to break into Texas in 2020 and a couple of other states. So please visit the El Segundo.